Good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar for, for Pace IT. Tonight's topic is storage devices and it's being taken from the CompTIA A plus exam to 2801 and the specific objective is 1.5. So what is that specific objective? That's where we get to talk about installing and configuring storage devices. Uh, their media, connections, and capacity. So let's go ahead and jump into tonight's webinar. And the first item up is magnetic storage. Floppies, floppy disk drives, hard disk drives, tape drives, and then flash solid state drives. So let's talk about floppy drives. It was an early form of removable media. Now, a lot of you who are watching this probably have never owned a computer that had a floppy disk drive. And I'm pretty certain all of us here have never owned one that had the first version, which was an 8-inch version. It became commercially available in 1971, which was well before the advent of the personal computer, at least what we think of as the personal computer. But it was available, and a lot of companies used it. That was replaced in 1976 by the five and a quarter inch floppy. By the way, they weren't very floppy, but they were kind of bendable, hence the name. Uh, and the five and a quarter got replaced by the three and a half inch floppy disk drive, which which came out in 1984. Now we're starting to get into realm where people will probably probably had PCs that had those. Uh, the most common size of three and a half floppy was the 1.44 megabyte. And I hate to say this, but I can remember the day when 1.44 megabytes seemed like a lot. Uh, kind of figured that if you had five or six of those, you wouldn't ever need any more capacity than that. But by today's standard, that's just minuscule. The connection for the floppies internally was a 34-wire ribbon cable. A lot of them were not keyed. The ribbon cable had a stripe, red stripe down one side. That was the pin one side. Uh, so you had to know which pin was pin one on your floppy drive and on your connection, your, flop, your floppy disk drive interface on your hard or on your motherboard so that you could insert the cable correctly. Uh, also, since they weren't keyed, a lot of the times it was actually fairly easy to insert the cable incorrectly onto the drive itself. Uh, a lot of the times when you did that, the disk drive light would light up uh, solid green all the time. So that's how you knew when it was incorrect. Now, <clears throat> most motherboards came with the floppy interface in the cable and you could have an A drive and a B drive and it was the cable that determined which drive was which. If you looked between the two connections, the two drive connections on the cable, there was a twist in the wire and the A drive actually came after the twist. So it was the one on the end. The B drive was always the one that was in the middle, and it came before the twist. That's kind of important for you to remember. So now let's move on to hard, hard disk drives. These are spinning disk drives. Uh, they contain rotating plotters within the disk. They have an armature and read heads that are contained within the drive itself. And something to remember, the faster they spin, the quicker the read-write operations. Speaking about spin rates, there were four common, or are four common spin rates for hard disk drives. Uh, 5,400 RPMs, 
7,200 RPMs, 10,000 RPMs, and 15,000 RPMs. Uh, it used to be back in the day that a 10,000 or 15,000 RPM disk drive only came with a SCSI interface. That's not true anymore. It comes with a whole bunch of different interfaces. Uh, but those feeds, the 10,000 and 15,000, were considered enterprise grade, and now they're considered uh, consumer grade. Their capacity, well, anywhere from a few gigabytes to multiples of terabytes, a whole lot larger than those floppy disk drives that we were just speaking about. Now, I mentioned the interfaces earlier. Well. Here we go. If you have an internal hard disk drive, it could be an IDE, which means that it would be a parallel ATA disk drive. You could have a SATA connection, serial ATA connection, or you could have an internal SCSI connection, small computer serial interface connection. Now your external connections for disk drives, if you happen to have external disk drives, could be USB, could be FireWire, could be eSATA, could be SCSI, or it could be Ethernet, particularly if you're running uh, your hard disk drives as network attached storage or as a storage attached network. So you could have any or all of those interfaces to connect to your external hard disk drives. Now let's move on to tape drives. So what tape drives are not as common nowadays as they used to be, thanks to the advent of larger um, hard drives and the cheaper storage or the dropping cost of hard disk storage, but their common usage is for scheduled backups of large amounts of data. There are several different types of tape drives out there. The most common are the ones that you need to know about are digital linear tape, DLTs. They have a transfer rate of up to 60 megabytes per second, and they were had capacities of up to 800 gigabytes per cassette. Then there's the linear tape open, LTO, that has a transfer rate of up to 140 megabytes per second. These ones have a little bit more capacity. Uh, they have a capacity of up to 1.5 terabytes. <clears throat> Your external connections for tape drives were usually SCSI or a serial attached SCSI. And believe it or not, tape drives are still in use. A lot of companies are still using tape libraries for their daily backups. And why is that? Well, they had a lot of money invested into those, those libraries, and they're very stable, and the technology is well understood. So that's why they're still there. Now let's move on to solid state storage. Uh, why did, what's the main advantage about solid state storage? Well, there's no moving parts. And because there's no, no moving parts, it's all storage on chips. They have increased read and write speeds. Uh, they can be very compact and highly portable. And they are composed of non-volatile memory storage chips. Because there's no moving parts, they also draw less power, which makes them more efficient. Now, there's a whole bunch of different types of solid state storage. The first one I'm going to mention is the CF, Compact Flash Storage. Uh, that comes in two versions, Type 1 and Type 2. And the way you tell them apart is how thick they are. Uh, type 1 is 3.3 millimeters thick, type 2 is 5 millimeters thick, and you can get CF or compact flash storage of up to 128 gigabytes. Now CF is not quite as um, 
popular is SB, which stands for Secure Digital. Uh, these are a little bit smaller in size, a little bit thinner, and you can actually get SB uh, memory cards that will store up to 2 terabytes of data. That would be an SBXC, which they're, they're fairly small, and you want to know what? That's a lot of storage on a, on a small amount of space. Um, I should mention that you're going, wow, so has SD completely supplanted CF cards? Not really. Um, Compact Flash is actually a little bit faster than SD in its operation and storage. So in some applications, you will still see um, applications that prefer that you use CF memory cards. In particular, if you're using uh, an SLR, like some of the Nikons, uh, they allow you to use either CF or SD cards, but they prefer that you use CF because it has a faster response. I know that doesn't have much to do with PCs, but I thought I'd throw that out there anyways. Now back to the SDs. SD cards come in different sizes. Um, the regular SD measures 24 by 32 millimeters. You can get a micro S. Actually, let's go to a mini SD. Mini SDs were 21.5 by 20 millimeters. And then there's the micro SDs, which are 15 by 11 millimeters. You see the micro SDs in a lot of smartphones and some of the tablets. Um, <clears throat> but they're not quite as popular as the mini SDs or the regular size SDs, probably because they're a little bit easier to lose. Another type of solid state storage that you need to know about is the XB. It is an older technology, and it was actually developed by Canon cameras. So it's, again, camera photo storage. Then we move on to USB flash drives. Guess what? It uses a USB interface. Uh, current max capacity on those is one terabyte. Not that I've seen any of those kicking around. Uh, the price of USB flash drives has been, has been dropping, which is a good thing for those of us who like to carry data with us at all the at all times. Now let's move on to solid state drives. These are flash, essentially, well, they're solid state hard drives. Um, they are slowly replacing spinning platters. They're still a little bit more expensive. Actually, they're still a lot more expensive, but they are becoming more and more common. <coughs> If you're using a solid state drive in your PC, it mounts right where your hard drive would mount, usually with an adapter bracket. And the most common interface connection, <coughs> excuse me, is the serial ATA connection, the SATA connection. Although something that is becoming a little bit more common, if you're willing to step up and pay the price, one second here. So if you want to step up and pay the price, you can get a solid state drive that has a PCIe interface. Why would you do that? Well, because that PCIe interface has a little bit faster um, pipeline, has a little bit faster pipeline, operates a little bit faster, your latency drops down a little bit, but you pay for it in a higher price. If you're using a solid state drive externally, so like a portable hard drive, you're going to either have a USB interface, a FireWire interface, or eSATA. 
most of these solid state drives you're going to, to find in probably the 60 gigabyte and up range as you go up price ramps up fairly rapidly. Now let's move on to optical storage, CD, DVD, and Blu-ray. So we start with the CD-ROM, which is compact disc, read-only memory. Uh, guess what? Can only be read to, cannot, cannot be overwritten. The base speed of a CD-ROM is 150 kilobytes per second. So if you see one that has a rating of 24 by, you take that 150 kilobytes per second and you times it by 100, or you times it by 24. And then you get how fast its transfer rate is. Max capacity on CDs is 700 megabytes. And then we have the CDR. That's recordable. You can write to it once. And then there's the CDRW. You can write to it multiple times. Now let's move on to DVDs. DVD-ROM, read-only memory, can only be read, can't be written to. It had a base speed of 1.39 megabytes per second with a max capacity of 4.7 gigabytes of capacity whole lot more space than that CD-ROM. Um, and we still found that that was not enough, so they developed the, the dual-layer DVD. Now, a dual-layer DVD, guess what? It has two layers that can be written to. It has a max capacity of 8.5 gigabytes, so you essentially double the DVD. And <clears throat> your options here are the DVDRW, which means that it is rewritable. You can be written to many times, and your DVDRW comes in both single layer and dual layer. Then we move on to Blu-ray. Most Blu-rays are read only. It has a base speed of 4.5 megabits megabytes, excuse me, per second, and we increased the capacity quite a bit again. Your capacity on a regular Blu-ray is 25 gigabytes. Again, we found that wasn't quite enough, so the dual-layer Blu-ray was developed, and guess what? Since it's a dual-layer, it has two times the capacity. That pushes you up to 50 gigabytes of capacity. Uh, it is, then there's the BDR, which is recordable, uh, which means you can write to it. Uh, comes in both single and dual layer versions. And then there's BDRE, which is recordable, erasable. So it is rewritable. You can write to it multiple times and do it over and over again. And that too comes in both single and dual layer versions. Now your CD-ROMs did come with a uh, PATA, parallel ATA interface, and then they came in SATA, serial ATA interface, if they were internal. DVD drives were the same. Uh, Blu-ray, you started moving away from the PATA, and they were essentially SATA. Uh, although I think you can find some PATA Blu-ray drives for internal. For external connections, guess what? It's USB, it's FireWire, and it is, let's see, USB, FireWire, eSATA, and in some cases I think you can even get the Thunderbolt if you're running an Apple system. But I'm not 100% certain of that. Now let's move on to a little bit of some special mentions here that you need to know about your storage. And the first thing that we need to mention is hot swappable. And what is hot swappable? That means that your PC 
and the device do not need to be powered down in order to replace the device. If it's still running, if it's a hot swappable, you can just unplug it and plug a new one in and you're ready to go. But the thing here is that um, we need to mention is that not all devices are hot swappable. So how do you know if it's hot swappable? Well, if it's a SCSI device, a small computer serial interface device, it might be hot swappable, but it might not be. You need to read the documentation that came with the device. But now if it's SATA, if it has a SATA connection, all SATA devices are hot swappable. Now if it's in, an internal SATA device, I really don't recommend hot swapping it unless you've already got your case open and it's unmounted. Um, because if you're going to hot swap it and your case is closed and your machine's running, you really should power it down before you open up your case. Now let's talk about cable connections. Uh, so if it is an IDE interface, which means it's a parallel ATA device, um, most of those devices have jumpers that need to be set, and your choices for jumper settings were master, slave, or cable select. If you set your device to master, that means that you wanted it to be the main drive on that IDE interface. If you set it to slave, that means it was going to be your secondary drive on that IDE interface. If you put it to cable select, that means you wanted the cable essentially does to, to select whether it was the primary or secondary drive. Cable select means that your um, between the device and the motherboard, it could determine could determine where on the cable it was plugged and where it plugged in would determine what kind of a device it was. <clears throat> If it was at the end of the cable, it was the master, and if it was plugged into the middle plug on the ribbon cable, then it was the slave. And you could only do that with the 80 wire IDE cables. Did not work with the 40, 10, 40 wire IDE cables. Now let's move on to SCSI devices. and connections considerations. All devices needed to have a SCSI ID. And your SCSI ID range is from 0 to 15. The SCSI controller is almost always given the ID of 7. Why is that? Well, because originally SCSI came with an ID range of 0 to 7. And 7 was given the highest priority and then six, five, four, three, two, one, zero in their priority rank. That was original SCSI. Then they came out with wide SCSI, and that extended the range, the ID range, up to 15. Uh, but they didn't want to reprogram everything, and they wanted to leave backwards compatibility. So uh, the SCSI controller was left at seven, and then your priority range. Your priority by ID range went 7, 6, 5, 4, 3, 2, 1, 0, 15, 14, 13, 12, 11, 10, 9, 8. That is something that you should remember um, when you go to take your test. Now, originally, your SCSI device your, on your SCSI device, your ID had to be set by jumpers. And it was in a binary arrangement. Newer SCSI, uh, you could set it by software. So that's a good thing that made it easier. Your SCSI devices can be daisy chained together. The one thing that I'll tell you is that the end device always needs to be terminated. And originally, that means that you had to put in a termination plug on the last device in your SCSI daisy chain. Nowadays, you don't need to do that. 
you can tell when it's the last device and it will automatically terminate itself. It does software termination. Now let's move on to RAID. Uh, RAID stands for Redundant Array of Independent Disks, which is a little bit different from when I originally learned it because back in the day it stood for Redundant Array of Inexpensive Disks. You should know both terms. Uh, just just so you don't get thrown for a loop. And what RAID is, is it's using multiple drives or volumes to create a single storage pool. It can be used to protect data, or it can be used to improve performance, or it can be used to protect data and improve performance. The first one that you need to know about is RAID 0, also known as striping. It can also be known as a striped set or a striped volume. Uh, RAID 0 requires two or more volumes, and the data is evenly added to the volume in stripes. It'll write a chunk to one drive and write the next block of data to the other drive, and it goes back and forth between them, and it really increases performance, both write and read. Actually, yeah, both write and read from a single drive. Um, you can use uneven sized volumes, but the thing I'll tell you is that if you're using a 50 gigabyte drive and a 100 gigabyte drive, you're effectively your 100 gigabyte drive is cut down to 50 gigabytes. The problem with uh, RAID 0 is it does not create any redundancy which means that if one disk goes down, the whole set is broken and you need to start over. And that's not a good thing. So how can we fix that? Well, instead of doing RAID 0, you can do RAID 1, which is also known as mirroring. Uh, these are also known as the mirror set or mirror volumes. They require, at a minimum, two disks. And the data is mirrored between devices. What is written to one device is then written to the other device. Uh, your write performance is not as good as RAID 0, but your read performance is increased. Why is that? Well, because your computer knows that the data, the same data is stored in two places, and both drives can read at the same time. One of the advantages is, is that if one disk goes down, your data is still safe because you have an exact copy on the other disk. So if one drive goes down, no problem, you still have the data, you remove the bad disk, you put in a new disk, you create a new mirror, and you're good to go. Now, one of the bad things about RAID 1 is the size of the combined volume is limited to the size of the smallest disk used in the array. So now what's next up on RAID? Well, that would be RAID 5. That's striping with parity. This requires the use of at least three disks or volumes, and it combines striping with parity correction. So what happens is you have three drives, uh, data is striped across two drives, and then a parity drip, parity drip, parity bit is placed on the third drive, and then it kind of alternates. So what was drive one, what received, let's go, drive one received a, a block, drive two received a block, drive three received a parity bit. Next write would be drive two, drive three, drive one would receive parity, and then it'd be three, one, and two would receive the parity bit. So it's rotated through the set so that no single drive contains all of the parity bits and it's evenly distributed. <clears throat> this does provide some fault tolerance because if any one disk goes down, uh, the data can normally be recovered from the parity bits and combining the data from the other two disks. It's a fairly efficient way to, to get the redundancy with some performance increases. 
works okay, uh, but it still wasn't enough. So what did they do? They came up with RAID 10. It's also no known as RAID 1 plus 0 or RAID 1 and 0. And what it does is it combines a RAID 1, a mirror set, with a RAID 0, which is striping. So it is a mirror with striping. And it requires a minimum of four disks or volumes. So it's a stripe of mirrors. There we go. That's the correct way to say it. And it actually provides the best performance out of all the RAIDs except for RAID 0. RAID 0 is still the fastest at reading and writing. Um, the next day at RAID 10 is pretty good, but it does require the four disks or volumes. And it is highly fault tolerant because you have the mirror set to go with the stripe set. And those are the RAIDs that you need to know for the 220-801 exam. There are a whole bunch of different RAIDs, but I'm not going to get into them. They really don't matter. And that concludes the information that you need to know. I thank you for watching this sem seminar, this webinar. Thank you very much.